It is no exaggeration to say that my career began with a drum solo. My first public performance was at my high school variety show in 1967 when I was 15, playing in a trio with Don Brunt on piano and Don Tease on tenor sax. Calling ourselves the Eternal Triangle, we played three songs. The number one rock standard of the times, Louis Loai, the Slow Beatles song, and I Love Her, and a rockin' original number we called, with ignorant would-be hipness, LSD Forever. In fact, the most psychedelic experience of my young life up to then was that very night, sitting on a wooden kitchen stool, wearing my favorite green and white polka dot shirt, and playing my red sparkle Stuart drums and Ajax cymbals in front of an audience. I made the racing stripe on the bass drum head with electrical tape. The arrangement of LSD Forever included a drum solo, and though I knew so little about playing drums back then that I can't imagine what I played that night, my solo received a tremendous response from the audience. For about the first time in my young life, I had done something that made my parents proud and brought me a little respect in the school hallway. Also, that drum solo got me into my first rock band, Mumblin' Something. My first performance with that band was at a dance at the YMCA in St. Catharines, Ontario. There was no stage, and we had to set up on the floor in a corner of the room with a couple of Christmas floodlights shining on us. In an effort to look hip and sophisticated, I wore my uncle's hand-me-down black and white herringbone suit with a green turtleneck, all of which itched furiously when I started playing. The worst thing, though, was that there was nothing to fasten my drums to, and when I started playing my solo in Toad, Ginger Baker's solo number with Cream, my drums and cymbal stands went sliding all over the place, and it was a disaster. I realize now, though, that night was an early example of my perfectionism and determination because when we took a break, I found some rope and tied my bass drum and hi-hat to my wooden stool, then convinced my fellow band members to play Toad again the next set so I could do it right. We did, and I did. From then on, a drum solo was a mainstay in every band I was in, and I slowly began to build an approach to soloing. Most of that approach was learned from other drummers, of course, sometimes from records, but mostly from watching them. How I love to watch drummers play. I've written before that growing up during the 60s in southern Ontario, I wasn't able to see American or British bands except on television, but I was fortunate that the Toronto area music scene was so vibrant at that time. Bands like the Mandela, Lighthouse, the Checkmates, the Yeoman, and many more all had a strong R&B influence, and they all had great drummers. And more, all of those drummers played solos. I remember reading an amusing comment in an interview with Stuart Copeland when he said that as a grown-up musician, he didn't like drum solos. But when he was a kid, any drummer who didn't play a solo was sneered at. That was how it was then. And in a way, I think it was good for me to learn about drum solos from being in the audience, rather than from records or from behind the drum set. As a young music fan, watching from the crowd, I picked up on what was exciting, what was dynamically effective, and what was musical. I soon realized that some of the best and most accomplished drummers were not necessarily good soloists. Sometimes they could be wonderful accompanists with all the groove, dynamics, and technique the music required, but their solos would be a stiff display of rudiments or an aimless ramble of rhythmic notions leading nowhere, dynamically or musically. Of course, even those solos were always interesting to a young would-be drummer, but not necessarily exciting to a young music lover, and I began to understand the difference. I've said many times that as a child, seeing the movie The Gene Krupa Story was my biggest inspiration to play drums. And Gene's solos, played by him and acted by Sal Minio, were a big part of that movie. So Gene's rhythmic, physical, showy approach to soloing was an early influence. Seeing Buddy Rich play on television many times in those days was also a big inspiration, if only in teaching me humility and the uncomfortable realization that I would never be able to play like that. Of course, no one else would ever be able to play like that either, but it seemed that other jazz drummers I saw on television, Joe Morello, Sonny Payne, Louis Belson, made me feel that way too. So I decided I had better stick to being a rock drummer. It was a bigger pond, all right, but perhaps not quite so deep. Technique might be obligatory in jazz, but it was sometimes optional in rock, though it didn't need to be that way. By the late 60s, there were a few rock bands putting drum solos on their records, usually live albums like Ginger Baker with Cream, Carmine Apice with Vanilla Fudge, Ian Pace with Deep Purple, Bobby Columby with Blood, Sweat and Tears, Danny Seraphine with Chicago, John Bonham with Led Zeppelin, Carl Palmer with Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and Michael Shreve with Santana. I learned from all of them. There were also drummers like Keith Moon. Actually, there were no drummers like Keith Moon. 
But Keith Moon always said he didn't like drum solos. I tended to think he played everything he knew or wanted in the songs. What would he ever play in a solo? Mitch Mitchell was a very active drummer that way too, as was Michael Giles with King Crimson, Phil Collins with Genesis and Brand X, Bill Bruford with Yes and his various solo projects. All of them were so expressive in their ensemble playing that it seemed they had already expressed everything they had to say. But I was strongly influenced by those drummers too, and their ideas and attitudes became part of my approach to soloing. I'm sure that with a little thought I could list a hundred drummers who have influenced me in meaningful, even measurable directions. I could point to this or that little figure I play and say, I learned that from so-and-so. And in many ways, my drum solo remains an ever-changing tribute to all of the drummers I have ever appreciated. You don't have to listen too hard to hear me emulating Gene Krupa's tom-tom rhythms, Buddy Rich's driving snare work, Michael Jowes' intricate syncopations, Keith Moon's explosive fluidity, or John Bonham's Bigfoot triplets. They were all so great. In more recent years, recent meaning the last 30 years of playing with Rush, the drum solo has developed into a fairly consistent part of a performance and a main part of the show, for me anyway. And it's something I always make it a matter of principle to change every tour. When we're setting up at the be beginning of the tour, I just want it to be a, a new presentation. And sometimes I'm even kind of reluctant about that change. I'll listen to my solo from the previous tour and think, well, I'm not really finished with that structure. There's still, I'm still quite happy to build on that and use it from night to night as my own kind of laboratory for de developing designs and also as a presentation for the audience. But again, as a matter of principle, I just force myself to do it and, and to make it new. And the reason for having a structure, too, is, is because it's a performance in front of an audience, I want a certain level of consistency. And just as the band does in our whole performance, it's, a, it's an element of... Um, what I want a Rush show always to be consistently good. And um, so within that structure, there'll be transitions that I, I have I've arranged to be fixed. But the elements within them will vary, and the way that I play them can vary greatly from night to night. But uh, it's important to me that it, it's a composition. And um, as a piece of music, it has linked movements and an arrangement and an architecture. And again, like a piece of music, to me, in, in the interior design of it, there are themes and dynamics textures, melody, humor, and uh, tension and release that's such an important part of uh, music in general, always. It's also, it's a performance to me uh, for the audience, and as I described before of growing up and being in the audience and watching drummers play, learning that aspect of, of what it's like to um, experience a drum solo from the other side. And uh, the visual aspect, too, is a big part of it as it is for um, a Rush concert in general and there's lighting involved and rear screen projections and other people who are performing even as I am, the lighting director following me, the video director for the images that appear on the rear screen, the cameraman shooting it, and uh, the film director who has made the accompanying uh, video montage that appears behind me. And um, there's a lot going on and it all starts with let's talk about the drums. Because it was our 30th anniversary tour, I really wanted to do something special just in the drum set alone. And um, where I live now in California, I'm just a short drive from the drum workshop factory, so I was able to visit regularly and look at different prototypes that we were developing with uh, John Good and the, the painter Louis and their transfer designer Javier. And they presented different ideas and we worked on them. And uh, basically, just this, we came up with a uh, design that combined 
elements from uh, logos from Rush albums over the years and uh, a basic black with the red pinstripe in fact is a reflection of the previous red sparkle drums I had in the uh, Test for Echo and Vapor Trails tours which also of course reflects my very first red sparkle Stuarts that I described earlier and the uh, graphic design in the um, centers of the shells is kind of modeled after Keith Moon's pictures of Lily set from uh, the 60s that was my dream drums when I was a teenager and it was very much a mode that I wanted to reflect in these. They, it was my dream set of drums so uh, I reflected what was my dream set of drums as a teenager too and when I was walking around the drum workshop factory I happened to see some shells hanging in the paint shop with the sparkly mirror finish and I said "Ooh, I'll have that so we used that in the, the middle of the uh, graphic design as well. And the symbols, um, a similar thing really happened. I was working with Sabian on developing the Paragon line and with um, Mark Love at the factory, their alchemist. And between us, we developed uh, some original approaches to the symbols. Mark's idea for the, uh, the lathing and the grooving and the hand hammering that all contributed to a sound uh, of the ride symbol and the crashes and the effect symbols that reflected the voice that I wanted to have symbol wise. Another element apart from the acoustic drums too was the electronics and um, I've been using since about 1983 I started with the Simmons electronics drums and we were working then on the songwriting for our, our Grace Under Pressure album and before recording that we went to Radio City Music Hall and just did five shows um, just as a kind of warm up before we went into the studio and we were playing some of the songs in which I was using the uh, electronic drums. Now I hadn't wanted to replace acoustic drums with electronics so in trying to think of how not to compromise what I had but to add a whole new element I came up with the idea of having a, a satellite kit I called it really which was the electronic drums would be behind me and would be a separate setup that I would stand up turn around and play but in the context of those shows I had to stand up turn around and play facing the back of the stage so um, I had to come up with some idea to resolve that so uh, before the tour came up um, we thought about it and decided okay well what we, what we needed was something that would allow me to turn around and play and still face the audience so we developed the rotating riser. Just like that. So uh, in the initial uh, Simmons setup I still stayed with using a small acoustic bass drum, in fact an 18 inch acoustic bass drum which was also a reflection back to my very first red sparkle drums. And I used a real snare and, and cymbals at that time and just added in the Simmons pads. And uh, as sampling and MIDI and, and electronic drums in general developed as I did and progressed and made so much more possible and gave me so many more ideas, um, I expanded, became a greater part of the show and our music and a, certainly a greater part of my solo. Um, so on this, uh, just before uh, Vapor Trails really, during the, uh, during the uh, pre-production and songwriting of that I started working with the V-drums and uh, eventually took the full step and uh, introduced electronic bass drum, hi-hat, cymbals, snare drum, everything. That brought us to uh, getting a set list together for uh, the 30th anniversary tour and um, we were going through and the last couple of tours I had taken my drum solo off the end of an instrumental of ours called Leave That Thing Alone. But as the three of us were discussing what songs we were going to play, we really had a time problem because we were trying to reflect 30 years of material in, well, <laughs> three and a half hours what it ended up to be, but we were trying really to keep it to three hours or less. So uh, we were looking at the songs we had and reluctantly giving up favorites and one of them that we decided would have to go was Leave That Thing Alone. So my solo was then floating in limbo as to where it was going to end up and right in the middle of that second set where uh, the natural place where we would usually put the drum solo we were doing a song called Red Sector A which was actually originally on that uh, Grace Under Pressure album recorded with the, the Simmons setup and um, I thought well that's not very good being set up on the back kit from there I would have to spin traditionally my solos have started on the front kit and then I'd go to the back one and then back to the front so I thought uh, well no, that's not very good. And I thought, well, it's different. It's daring. Maybe I should. Maybe I could. Okay, let's do it.
And that solo was recorded in uh, Frankfurt, Germany during the 30th anniversary tour. And uh, because the previous one recorded in Brazil on the Russian Rio DVD, I'd called O Baterista, which was Portuguese for the drummer. This one became Der Trommler, which is German for, you guessed it. Um, so I wanted to start off just by saying what we're going to do here. I'm not going to go through and demonstrate and try to tell anyone how to play my solo. The point is really just to help uh, inspire you to play your solo, find your voice, and uh, by example, maybe show where some of my tools have come from and concepts have come from and uh, trigger your own imagination really is the, the hope. So we're going to step through all of the elements and the movements of, uh, of this solo and along the way recount the narrative that it tells, uh, the autobiographical aspects of it and um, the basic conceptions that make things possible and the possibilities that make imagination happen. So uh, having made the decision, as I said earlier, to start the solo on the back kit, um, then it was a question of starting, what will I start with? And I had listened to the O Baterista solo and I still liked it and still, as I said before, as, as always with previous solos, it was still nurturing in the sense that I could still use it as a vehicle for exploration and it was still a good, um, vehicle for performance from an audience point of view. No real reason to change it except the principle of change that I make, uh, I challenge myself, kick my own self to um, make that happen. So I was going to be starting from the back hit, which was the middle of the O Baterista solo. I said, okay, we'll make it the front for a start. That's, that's a big change and the first time I've ever opened a solo from the back hit. And it happened that uh, because starting there and rearranging the other elements and segments of the solo as they came along, it actually started to have a historical narrative about it, completely unsuspected by me. But once I looked at it later, I realized, well, I was starting with African drumming in both of its senses. It opens with the heartbeat echoing around the room where um, our front of house sound man, Brad, picks up what I do and echo repeats it and it bounces all around the room. And the, Talking drums in African, West African villages were actually big log slit drums that were resonant enough that they would carry through the rainforest to the next village and they could send messages, probably not unlike Morse code. And um, I go from that opening statement, which perfect, both heartbeat and communication, the element of drumming, and then into dancing, a, a classic rhythmic African um, dancing pattern. And um, throughout, the, as the solo moves along, Having stated that, then the next thing I go to is really just a fast march, which is pretty much the origin of European drumming coming from that, and then from there into a waltz, which is the basis of European dance, and then both of those come together as they did historically in America, where uh, those influences came together and became jazz and became Latin music and became rock music. So uh, that was just an unsuspected thematic um, concept that emerged subconsciously at least and probably completely accidentally but uh, interesting nonetheless so it opens with the heartbeat and then um, i have a series of samples that i'd set up originally actually for a song called scars on our presto album in 1989 it was when sampling was first starting to become usable and i had uh, was looking for something special for this song and tribal influence and i combined african drums congas uh, timbali um, tambourine and um, all of those became a drum part that I used variations of that actually we're going to step through now because it's a big part of this opening part of the solo but um, what I've done with that is because I had the samples for those patterns then I broke them down and started improvising with what else could be done with that same arrangement of sounds and uh, this opening pattern was just um, an improvised rhythmic the dancing drums idea uh, based around those and I'll, I'll just step through the samples that are there and you can get an idea of what the palette of colors um, was that I was creating from and then I'll show you some of the places it took me and, and the variations that I used in playing the same pattern but um, upbeat pattern on the hi-hat at first with my foot for example and then I switch over to um, a hi-hat trigger on, um, on the foot on the downbeat so uh, that's again I have uh, over starting starting from our left this timbali over there and then the same one so i can get a conga pattern going with two hands even though they're that far apart and then a west african djembe and i think back in the day that was called a doom doom drum 
And um, then I've used the, the V drums otherwise with uh, bass drum, snare drum, hi-hat, and um, the foot trigger in this case is the uh, tambourine that's going to come in part way through. So I'll just play a quick abbreviated version of, of that uh, first movement and then show the one change that it comes through and then lead us up to the next section. So opening, what I'm playing just for the heartbeat is and then the sound man again bounces that around the room and then uh, I go from there just to to uh, the marimba section, call and response. This was originally created as a practice piece uh, for my amateurist marimba playing. I, my first instrument actually as a child was piano, forced by my mother, um, probably when I was 10 or so, and uh, I really didn't take to it at all and uh, got out of it every excuse I had. But it did serve me well, as nearly anything you learn in life does in a way. And um, as I got into drumming more, always looking for more things to explore, I think as most drummers are, I took on uh, keyboard percussion and got into marimba and glockenspiel and wanted to learn more about it. And even uh, learned how to play guitar. I got Alex to show me different chords and learned all the bar chords and had an understanding of the playing of guitar, which of course helps me relate better to the other musicians, gives me a better idea of composition and, and what they're orchestrating with their instruments. So with uh, keyboard percussion, I wanted to practice it, so I recorded this one was just all done with sequencers. Again, I was learning how to work a synthesizer too and creating keyboard pads and a sequence. Uh, I made drum machine patterns for the whole thing, um, often using real African rhythms that I'd heard in uh, West Africa. I've traveled quite a lot there and heard a lot of drumming and, and even played some drums there too. So those rhythms were part of Momo's Dance Party was the name of a song, which was uh, based on an experience I actually had in the tiny Republic of Togo one night with a character named... Um, Momo and uh, a group of um, Americans and Canadians I was traveling with by bicycle there and this village put on a talent show for us and everybody got involved and I was drumming with the drummers and the other bicyclists were all dancing with the Africans and it was just a wonderful experience and um, so I called this little piece Momo's Dance Party and, and um, created the, the keyboard pads and rhythmic variations then I would play marimba in real time to it and I can remember uh, being up at my cottage and I just play it over and over again and improvise on the marimba and learn more and more what worked harmonically. Um, again, keyboard percussion, two distinct things. I was learning what worked rhythmically, what worked melodically and uh, it was a very rich experience. Eventually I decided uh, the drum set kept compelling me to be the sole um, outlet and, and the sole thing that I would concentrate on because there's so much to it and I experimented with hand drums again a lot of drummers do you want to learn everything and understand everything but eventually drum set is, is a lifetime of exploration and learning and challenge so I've kind of brought that into my arsenal I can use it for the band too is an important thing it's a trio uh, we at one time started to feel a limitations of just being guitar bass and drums so the other guys were bringing in um, 12 string guitars and foot pedals and keyboards and I started adding a keyboard percussion just as different textures and uh, different sounds for the, for the whole group sound. So uh, keyboard percussion, Momo's Dance Party was a practice piece. I was looking for something interesting in the solo and I thought if I could, this was another real juggling act too, of course, to be able to play the keyboard percussion and hit those tiny little dots over here and then come back and, and uh, play alternating call and response. Um, kind of drum patterns with it, but it's the kind of thing I'd, I worked on at home and uh, then just brought it into the, the solo gradually and, and worked on it through rehearsals until it was ready to play in front of people. Um, and also, again, becomes kind of the narrative and, and the uh, ongoing story that uh, the drum solo is meant to tell.
I mentioned before how the uh, sample layout on the pads was uh, first developed for the song Scars, and this next uh, passage steps through the rhythmic variations that I used in that song, and first just the bubbling conga pattern, and then bringing in other drums for accents. Then I have a snare drum comes in, um, plays the uh, backbeat on the floor, a bass drum, and um, the, the uh, midi marimba at this point now has become another conga note. So I'll just uh, step through and then I'll break down the way that technique and technology uh, made such an approach possible for me. song and of course because it's percussion and drum um, active it works very well as a uh, solo element too and of course quite a stretch left hand to get around there and forget about doing it traditional grip and the next little item then it just comes back again to the uh, opening heartbeat which was always the framing piece of this uh, the rear kit uh, segment and then I wanted some sound going on while the spin was going on. I've used different effects over the years, once even a harp glissando and different sound effects. So I asked one of our technical boffins to give me a selection of just weird um, electronic effects, basically. And I assigned them all to an octave on the keyboard. So every night it's a random thing where I can hit them at different times. And they're all somewhat different sounds. Um, so that, it, it, again, it's, it's something that accompanies the spin every night. So it's a part of the organized structure, but at the same time it's random and creative in that I, I would always mess around with different combinations of these ugly noises. So I'll just hit three of them at random as I would normally do in the show. And um, that would be the trigger to spin us back around to the main set. And this brings us around back to front, as it were, which is a good place to be. And kick things off in high gear here with a, a fast march, basically just four on the floor bass drum, and then on the snare drum alone, um, everything I can possibly do with the single stroke roll on the snare, from uh, 16ths and, and uh, eighths and quarter notes and accents and uh, triple triplet feel time across the quarter note feel, and then winding up with a climax building, building, something that I remember having done in my solos back to when I was a teenager. This builds, builds excitement, builds tension. In this case, I'm building up to a tension, then a release, and then <sighs> complete change of mood and texture as I go into the what I call the waltz section, which is based upon uh, a classic Max Roach solo from the late 50s called The Drum Also Waltzes. Max introduced that idea, but I, I never heard Max play it. I heard Bill Bruford play it. In 1985, I was in London recording, actually, on our uh, Power Windows project, and went to see uh, Bill and Patrick Moraz had a group called Earthworks at the time, and Bill was playing an all-acoustic setup, and he introduced the solo with, uh, with credit to Max, and then played it, and it kind of stuck in my mind, and not immediately, but a year or two later, I just started fooling around with it and thinking, well, what could I do with that? And uh, it became a practice exercise that grew and grew and grew till this day, uh, 15 years later or more. It, it was so uh, challenging to try to do anything over that waltz time, and I would just lay down uh, the one, two, three, one, two, three with the bass drum and hi-hat. And at first it was all I could do just to play a simple single stroke roll over top of it. It was 
frustrating and, and I'm surprised in retrospect that I didn't just give it up as something that I just couldn't do, but um, there was something intriguing about it and challenging about it and took me places I hadn't been before. So I would keep working on it and uh, developing it and um, started using it uh, in my solo pro in the early 90s or so. And I remember around that same time, I uh, produced the uh, uh, Buddy Rich tribute record and I was talking with Steve Smith about it and he was telling me that he also used it um, for part of his clinic presentation. And when I met Max Roach, I told Max that a lot of us younger guys were uh, still using his idea that he had come up with more than 30 years ago at that time. And Max seemed a little ambivalent about it. He wasn't sure how he felt about us um, young spark plugs using his idea as if we were stealing it or something. And when I mentioned that response to uh, Bill Bruford uh, later in the week when I met him, he said that uh, if there was something that he had done that people were still doing 30 years later, he'd be pretty flattered by it. Uh, so I kept using it in my solo and every day in my warm-up and in my pre-show warm-up and in my practicing at home, I would just always make that part of the program and it was always a complete change, change from my other um, interests and, and my other exercises and so on. And it just was, seemed so nourishing, the changes, whatever I could do was always so um, satisfying to accomplish anything and it was always an adventure every day I could start from a different place on the drum set and try different sorts of figures and get more and more complicated with it and uh, in my solo I would do it sometimes with bass drum and hi-hat on the bottom and with the snare on moving around the kit and then I would change and go to uh, bass drum with a tambourine sample on the left foot and turn the snares off and give it a darker more tribal feel and then I had a, a thunder sample that I introduced into it um, to give it more of that kind of mood and that more, more of that kind of texture. And again, years go by, tier, uh, tours go by, more practicing at home, uh, more pre-show warm-ups, and still I keep working on the same exercise. And then I had a real breakthrough on the um, Vapor Trails tour where finally I was free of time and I could keep that ostinato going with my feet and go anywhere with my hands, completely out of time, slow down at any tempo, speed up at any tempo, move around uh, jagged Latin fields across the bar all over the place. And there was a certain feeling of liberation and again, the satisfaction of, of conquering a, a challenging um, puzzle really. And then on this tour, I had a further breakthrough where I had kind of set a goal at the beginning where I was going to try to um, take that to another place, take it higher and, and introduce other time signatures on top of it. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I could play 7-8 on top of that 3-4 and uh, then play 4-4 four, four on top of it was actually surprisingly even more difficult. So in this solo, it's, it's clear there's parts of it where I'm going into 7-8 pattern and then I really state it broadly with the flam, which again seems simpler, what was actually harder than just rolling around in 7-8 for it. And I do the alternating 4-4 um, four, four patterns, which actually are from another song of ours, um, uh, the song Test for Echo, where I do those uh, alternating uh, paradiddle-based um, Tom Tom and snare drum figures, I adapted those to fit in over top of the 3-4 and got a tremendous sense of accomplishment from just conquering that. And it's uh, probably, you could stay with this, um, the waltz for a lifetime of exploration. I still use it all the time in my warm-ups before the show and, and in my practice routine. It's just always fun, it's always different and uh, inspiring. It's the kind of thing that you can find for yourself and um, allow you to explore different areas and persevere with it because, it, like I said, it seemed impossible. I was ready to give up, but don't be stopped by the impossible. Uh, just keep trying it every day and uh, put it aside. It, it's, I can compare it to crossword puzzles when I first started doing the New York Times crossword puzzle, I would spend all week on it and chip away at it a little bit, a little bit, until finally I could do it all in one day and then in an hour. And um, it's just the, the perseverance of to keep going and be inspired by your accomplishments and uh, not be threatened by your limitations. So when I first started working on this and tried to do something, it was all I could do really just play the foot pattern and then try to start introducing the simplest possible stickings across it.
So in the course of the solo for me every night, it's uh, one of the most improvised sections in that some nights I'll deliberately start down low on the toms or start up high or start with um, just anything that occurs to me trying to keep it as free and as exploratory as possible so that every night it is that kind of a voyage and every night it takes me and the audience somewhere different. I mentioned before how in the course of riding this waltz time vehicle um, and the previous tour I was able to break through the time barrier and during this tour get through the time signature barrier. And it's interesting to note that when I state the 7-8 theme in this, which was really a standalone experiment for me, it's actually the first of four times that that uh, motif appears throughout the solo quite unintentionally, but it's just I think a reflection of um, a pattern that I have a real great affection for. Uh, rhythmically and technically and tends to appear or even be um, intimated sometimes in, in other patterns and other contexts in a way that just um, grew organically out of my interests and out of challenges and out of a, uh, something that excites me I think and that tends to communicate itself through the solo in a way that once again I hope the audience will feel. Now here's another place where I've gone for a complete change of mood and texture and another tension and release moment where I've built up this repetitive, dark, um, rhythmic pattern, insistent coming at you and coming at you, and it ends with the final thunder rolling away and then the punctuation of crash cymbal bass drum and then just a cloud, the uh, rudimentary snare drum, nothing above it or below it, and just kind of floating along um, loose and uh, just effortless, I think, from a listening point of view, texturally, get mood, um, atmosphere, ways to, to change the listener's perception of the solo. And this also, um, one will notice that uh, here I change to traditional grip, which brings us to the subject of the great grip issue. Um, when I first started taking lessons at age 13, my first teacher, Don George, started me off with traditional grip, and as I learned the 26 rudiments as there were in those olden days, I practiced them on pillows and on magazines over and over again, day after day, spent all that time learning them. And then when I started playing in rock bands, I switched to match grip just for the power and the fashion of the day. And still though, returned to a traditional grip when I needed rudimentary passages uh, for almost the next 30 years because I figured in my own mind that if I'd spent all that time developing those techniques, it wasn't worth it to uh, invest all that time in once again relearning all the same things just with a different uh, a grip. So uh, carried on like that, used what I needed when I needed it um, until in the early 90s when Freddie Gruber came on the scene and I started working with him as my teacher and uh, he encouraged me basically to start all over was what it amounted to that I would be uh, sitting differently, setting up the drums differently, playing differently, hands and feet. And he just said, uh, don't worry about the grip. It's all the same, traditional grip, match, it doesn't matter. But uh, in the spirit of that reinvention, I decided that I would uh, devote myself to taking that to every possible level, every possible extreme. So uh, all my practicing virtually daily for the next two years, um, I worked on everything that I did with traditional grip and when I got back working with the band working on our Test for Echo album, I also 
made that same pledge. I just decided to keep going that way and learned in all the songs and created all the drum parts with traditional grip and recorded that whole album that way. And uh, following that did the um, a work in progress uh, instructional video and outlined my thinking what developments had led me to that point. And um, as far as I knew at that point, that was what it would be. Now, I returned to regular work after that, went on tour, played all of those songs uh, in concert, traditional group, but all the old songs and my drum solo would be played match grip as they always had. And that led me to a realization that it was still possible to use both, again, for, for the job at hand, use the technique necessary. So uh, through that tour and into the next album, Vapor Trails, um, Match Grip again just emerged as the right approach. I had a whole new understanding of uh, the physical playing of the, drum six, of the drum set and the drumsticks in my hands and applied that to Match Grip so that it was still never the same as it had been before. Um, but, and, and in uh, Vapor Trails, the, the song Vapor Trail, I open it, it's got a um, rudimental drum passage there that I use traditional grip because that was the best technique to use. So now I'm using both again, and this is a fine example that when I have a need for uh, traditional grip, I have that, and I'm using both, but with a new understanding and a new physical relation to the drums, such that when I watch myself play from former years and watching old concert videos and so on, there's such a huge difference in the, my physical relation to the drum set, and not in any one aspect, but in a dozen small ways, from my hands up through my arms and my shoulders, my whole torso, my whole being really is oriented towards the drum set in a completely different way. So that's the way growth has brought me back in some ways to the same place I was, but with a completely uh, different understanding to what I had before. And in that section, I kind of call the floating snare section, in which there's no real tempo. Um, it's really implied rather than stated. And then I break out of that with quite the opposite, like the rolling section, I would call it, where the bass drum comes in strong on the four, and then I'm just rolling around, centered on the snare from toms to toms, very rhythmic and uh, a lot of motion. And I was thinking earlier that uh, this is the kind of thing that when I was younger, my whole solo really would have made up of that. So this is like a compressed version of um, of a very classic uh, drum solo approach. And there's also one point in there where the 7-8 theme is just kind of implied um, rather than actually played, but there's a, the accented part of a 7-8 pattern. It's just brought in again quite by accident once more, but it's just an example of a motif that obviously is near and dear to my personal pulse that uh, keeps popping out in different places. 
And uh, from there, I go into a place that I just call Beyond Time because there is no tempo at all. And it's a series of staccato patterns, different parts of the kit, different figures, completely random. One of the more improvised parts of the solo from night to night and can, can vary greatly, particularly because it depends so much on precision and energy, which unfortunately being human, that does vary from night to night with all of us. So uh, with that, I just move around and do whatever occurs to me, try to keep it. Del deliberately angular, uh, jerky, and um, just move around and then stick in a bit of cowbells just for a strange textural change. It's goofy and whimsical, but there's nothing wrong with that in the context of a drum solo either. And then I gather up uh, propulsion once again and um, move into triplets, return the sense of drive to it once more and moving around the kit, but always with double bass drum just throbbing away underneath it. And originally that was when I was uh, starting out very young. Um, John Bonham and Led Zeppelin were new in those olden days and uh, John Bonham did always the big uh, triplets with his giant bass drum. I had two little bass drums at the time, so I just added those in and had kind of four beat triplets as uh, my variation on it. And then over the years found many ways to uh, develop that to apply it to uh, songs outside of the solo. And uh, for a while, Tommy Aldrich was playing with Pat Travers Band, and they opened for us for a whole tour. And he had some interesting ideas that he used the double bass drum triplets in a rising sense, up to a downbeat, or up to a, a cymbal crash and um, snare drum hit. And it's, uh, in a conceptual sense, this is an example of exploration for later application, where you can use your drum solo as a place to try out different ideas and become comfortable and confident with them, and developing an understanding of all of their variations and possible applications in the risk-free environment of the solo where if things go wrong or come out some other way, um, not only does no one have to know about it, but it can also be um, a fresh part of the solo where there are no mistakes, just new parts, as a jazz musician once said to me. Um, so that's, that's an important conceptual thing about the solo, what it can mean to you uh, as a player. It can introduce you and give you a chance to try out things um, in real time without the worry of affecting the other musicians or worse perhaps affecting the uh, the music so bringing the the uh, big bass uh, double bass drum triplets to a climax I stop and then go into a, a goofy little cowbell thing that um, I saw years ago in a Marx Brothers movie and I think it was Chico Marx with his knuckles just playing on the black keys played this little melody and one day fooling around with the cowbells I just noticed that I could play that same melody on them so introduce it into the solo in a place where I'd used over the years the little um, um, post time uh, horse racing just things like that introduced into the solo that take away from the seriousness and the bombast and the constant assault that a drum solo can be and uh, entertains me of course and and also the audience as well so at uh, this point, I'm just going to break down uh, a few variations of double bass drum triplets in ways that I've used them rhythmically and ways that they can be applied in different parts of the beat to lay over the tempo in different manners and just perhaps give some suggestions to you, again, in a conceptual sense of how one idea that you play within your solo can then be applied um, to the real music business. And uh, next little movement is uh, another nice dynamic shift and textural shift because I get over onto the MIDI marimba. And what I'm playing here is a little piece called Pieces of Eight that I created in 1985, actually, while we were in the uh, studio working on the songwriting part of our Power Windows album. And I just started experimenting um, not only with the MIDI marimba, which was pretty new at the time, but with the whole world of MIDI and synthesizers, learning how to operate all that and how it worked. The days when synthesizers had giant floppy disks that had to go into them with uh, memories of different sounds. And I learned that if the MIDI cable was too long, the delay was, was too long from the time I hit something to the, when the sound came out. 
So I just started experimenting and learning with a piece like that and recorded uh, the marimba piece and then overdubbed drums to it. And so consequently, it was like a, a whole learning enterprise of my own going on while the, the band's progress of songwriting and arranging was going forward. Whenever there was a bit of spare time or people were busy with other things, I would get into the studio and just experiment with these things and learn about double tracking, learn about using MIDI and synths. And of course, because I was playing a melodic instrument based on my early piano training and so on, just trying to learn a little bit more and develop a little bit more of my limited knowledge of um, harmony and bass parts and so on. So it was a great learning exercise just there. And also having the MIDI marimba come along about that time allowed me to replace the glockenspiel that I used to have and giant uh, orchestra chimes I used to have behind me. And not only that, but I started using samples of uh, coins on, on that same uh, Power Windows album. Some of my old drum sets, I would take samples off the master tapes and use the electronic drums to trigger those. I had an old Chinese drum at home that was too fragile to travel, so I got a good sample of it and was able to use that. So it was all part of that birth of sampling through there, but the MIDI Marimba was particularly useful for so many things during the show that I use it not only for keyboard percussion effects, but still to trigger those coins in the song The Big Money. In, fa in fact, or it still comes in handy for that. And uh, as we saw earlier, it's a conga drum sometimes, just a handy little thing over there. But it is quite a stretch in uh, the opening part of Pieces of Eight where I'm playing bass drum and a tambourine sample. So I have to be rooted over here still and get over there and play those parts accurately on those tiny little keys and then alternate that with fast. Um, again, the, the seven eight thing comes in big here, both in the marimba section and in the, the call and response drum sections too. So that was a, a great experiment at the time and was I took it out of my solo for a while. Actually, this is an example of something I talked about earlier that parts that I'll take out and then when I this time I was looking for a melodic bridge and a textural change and I thought, okay, let's bring back the old uh, pieces of eight um, call and response part and uh, put it in that part of the solo and build again the structure, the architecture that I was looking for. It became the element that I was after. And from that, um, I kind of burst out again with a, a, a strong propulsion um, bass drum driven part, and then the double hand crossovers come along. And when I first started taking lessons, my first teacher, Don George, told me that the two most difficult things I would ever have to learn were double hand crossovers and four-way independence. And um, four-way independence is still working on 40 years later, but uh, there was one day in the garage when I was a teenager where I just went out there and started messing around with, I had one hand crossover, I think, at that point. And I was just trying to find the math, basically, that allowed one hand to pass over the other and back and forth. So eventually I had that epiphany in the garage and uh, figured out the exact number of beats either way that made that possible. So I'm just going to break that down slowly and um, show the sticking that makes that possible. Uh, movement of the solo coming up is the big band section. Uh, one of my earliest influences since in childhood, um, when my father was a, a big band fan and Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett was the music of my earliest childhood. And uh, again, this relates back to the sampling times too, because uh, when I first started using the samples in the 80s, I came across a set of samples from Count Basie records of horn shots and started using them, I think, in my solo around um, 1989. I know they appear on the Show of Hands video. I think it was the first time I used them. And um, when we went to make, in fact, that uh, live album and uh, live video, I didn't feel right about using the samples of 
the real Count Basie band. So I had uh, one of the engineers in the studio recreate them for me on a Fairlight synthesizer. And so uh, the ones that I've used from that time to this are actually my own samples imitating Count Basie, which is, that's probably fair game. And although I've used this uh, as either one part of the solo or another, often the climax of the solo for uh, quite, a, quite a few years, I deliberately change it every time, sometimes move the samples to different pads or force myself to uh, give up the patterns that have, have evolved. Because it starts always, when I conceive the solo, it's improvised. But of course, as the tour goes on, I fall into patterns that please me and that work well together. And although it's still free form and not particularly organized, inevitably, as with a lot of these improvised parts of the solo, I fall into things that I like along the way and they become um, more or less habitual from night to night. So to prevent that happening from tour to tour, I deliberately start with a fresh palette, both in my mind and sometimes in the physical layout of the kit as well. So uh, I'm just going to demonstrate where those triggers are located and how I'm um, kind of choreographing that physically because I have them dispersed around the drum set from, from side to side. So uh, all the way to the pad on this side, to the pad on this side, a floor trigger, and then a little trigger pad just nestled right in here that um, a lot of times people can't see, but it's, it's handily located for me. So the way I have them dispersed, So uh, I'll just, I'll make something up as I go along. And finally, I lead up with that and do a long, slow retardando and then trigger the shout chorus of One O'Clock Jump. Again, one of my earliest musical memories. Um, my dad playing not only the uh, Count Basie records, but there's a live records, Sinatra at the Sands, with uh, Frank and Count Basie's band. And that motif con continually repeats through that record, and I remember it from being a small kid. <laughs> I was uh, choosing material to play with the Buddy Rich tribute, the concert first and then for the album. An obvious choice for me was Buddy's band's arrangement of One O'Clock Jump. And I think just before the Vapor Trails tour, I was looking for another variation on the big band idea and something different to do. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I could just play along with that final shout chorus of One O'Clock Jump and uh, trigger the band part of it and play along with it. But obviously, um, a big band shout chorus is not normally part of a rock concert, so there was a bit of a risk-taking aspect to that as an experiment. But when I cons consulted with my fellow band members and played it for them, they were so supportive and, yeah, go for it, it's going to be great, you'll see. And uh, because Getty is responsible for a lot of the uh, visual aspects of the show and the films on the screen behind us, he was inspired to um, have 
his uh, creative people come up with a great little animated movie that would accompany um, my performance of the One O'Clock Jump Chorus. And uh, they have great cartoons and, and uh, archival footage of dancers and Buddy Rich shows up in there a couple of times. And it's just a great little part that also doesn't have to be in sync with me and I don't have to be worrying about being in sync with it. It just uh, can float over the tempo. As long as they're rhythmically related, then it seems uncannily well synced. But in fact, it's, it's just the fact that they're the relation among the, the tempos involved just works no matter what, really. So uh, this is another example of tension and release, too, for me, because I return to accompanying a band, in this case, the Buddy Rich Big Band. And uh, that's a nice feeling, too, because the solos behind me, I've gotten through all of that part, and now I'm just playing along with a, a smoking hot uh, big band. So that's a wonderful feeling. And also brings me back to the idea of being part of a band, because for all of us, after the solo, after all, you have to go back to being part of the band. So, let's go. The inevitable gong, dumb but undeniably right. Well, in the rock and pop music of the early 2000s, drum solos are not very common and seem to be temporarily out of style. However, I have to think that will change, or I hope so, anyway. Popular taste is cyclical, not to say fickle, and though musical fashion may temporarily celebrate the sensational or simplistic, it always does seem to return to basic values of musicianship and qualities of professionalism, eventually. For more than 80 years, drum solos have been delighting audiences, from small clubs to vast stadiums, and I have no doubt they will continue to do so forever. A drum solo can be an enjoyable and demanding performance for the drummer, an enjoyable and not too demanding experience for the audience, and a nice break for the other guys in the band. From the pioneers like Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, and Joe Morello, to modern masters like Billy Cobham, Terry Bozio, and Steve Smith, there is a tradition handed down our heritage, as it were, expressed in drum solos. And it's up to us all, as drummers, to keep that tradition alive. I want to say, go forth into the musical wilderness and play well. In the course of preparing for the 30th anniversary tour, we've done months of rehearsal in Toronto and then moved down to Nashville for pre-production rehearsals for a couple of weeks, and then the inevitable nerve-wracking uh, experience of the first show. And I was uh, keeping notes and journals and um, gathering information on this tour with the hope and the purpose of writing a book about it after. And in looking over my journal notes from the third show at Virginia Beach, I noticed it recounted an illustrative example of the highs and the lows that uh, the professional performing musician can be heir to in a night. The show last night, so nearly perfect really, already felt that autopilot mentality the pleasant flow of things coming out of me without having to be provoked. Especially the drum solo, finally got everything I wanted in there in terms of elements and transitions. 
each of them very, very spirited and free-spirited, truly improvised. What I've been trying to get into the waltz section of interposing the odd times over it, I managed to get a really nice pattern of seven going over the three, and now it's time for five. And the four over three, too, got it perfectly together. The whole solo, the big band section and everything, was what I had wanted it to be for the last seven weeks or so. And then I get to the very climax of the one o'clock jump bit and hit that sample, and it doesn't go. And I hit it again, and it still doesn't go. Not knowing what else to do, I just played onto it in my mind, I guess you'd say, and played through the drum part, climaxed with it, and poof. Of course, of all the samples in the whole show not to go, that's about one of the worst ones, but it's an example of an anticlimax that can ruin even the, the best performance. And in the course of a whole tour of 50, 60, 70 shows, there will really only be a handful that are what I call magic shows, where just everything comes together in a transcendent way, where the band and the crew are perfectly aligned and the audience is in unison with us there, this flow of energy that's like a force of nature. And one of, a good example of that was the very last show on the Vapor Trails tour in Rio de Janeiro, where we shot, of course, the Russian Rio video, where we had everything against us that day, and the trucks had arrived late, and there was no sound check. Things were soggy from rain and had failed the night before, and there was every reason in the world to expect a complete nightmare and disaster. But in fact, it became a totally transcendent experience where the band and myself and my drum solo just elevated to a previously unattained level, really. It was just everything you would want a final show to be, everything you would want a show that was being filmed and recorded to be. So that was an example of the, the triumphant nature of it. And another one was um, a couple of nights after this Frankfurt solo that we've been anatomizing, uh, we played in Hamburg and again had one of those nights where things just flowed out in such a beautiful natural way. And I happen to have a um, video representation of that that's just from the cameras that we use in our show that shine up in the back screen behind us and just a mix off of the front of house board but uh, illustrates in some of the um, elements of the solo that we've talked about that are more um, experimental and exploratory and improvised on the night you can very much see I think the subtle differences in those changes that uh, are worth having a look at and um, seeing what you think.
And uh, one other sidebar we can present is um, during my morning warm-up here, um, I just did a little exploration, we're going to call it, where uh, I just went through some of the things that interest me and nourish me and take me new places and refine things. And I even found, in fact, that uh, some of the things that we've talked about in concepts and growing and using the solo as your little laboratory um, took me places I hadn't been before. And I was able to come out of the waltz section and take some of those lessons that of um, layering time signatures, I guess you'd say, and, and uh, find new things that just happened that day.